and, and they all the the women if you if you see movies of uh, the era where they wear this they all look short fat tight <laughs> and ugly i don't know how how they manage that <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Quackcast. This is Quackcast number 484. We're talking about background styles in this particular Quackcast because this is a uh... You know, for a comic site, Drunk Duck, <laughs> and we do comics, and we can talk about art occasionally, <laughs> and not just uh, writing and characters and all that kind of stuff. So, we're going to talk about that, and I'm not rating from a news post for once, um, but before we get into that, I'll have to introduce Baines and Tance, who are with me. Hi, guys. Hello. 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 No pit, because pit is doing uh, something very important today so what we're going to talk about before backgrounds is robbing a liquor store <laughs> oh sorry i wasn't supposed to say you weren't supposed to say that now <laughs> now I now you would not want to get your cat names oh <laughs> my god <laughs> she'll be recognized damn you I just got so excited you grass <laughs> you snitch <laughs> <laughs> You can't keep your trap shut. I know. <laughs> I've seen more friends go down in flames. <laughs> and you're at the root of all of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a common factor. <laughs> all right. Well. It hasn't been any big sites yet, so that's not <laughs> Before we get into that, we our choir is going to tell us about Elbiverse, El Elbiverse. So, choir, tell us about the featured comic Elbiverse. Hello, this is Queen Galaxy, and the feature I've selected for this week is L W B Verse by L O L What Burger, and it is rated E for everyone. Burger Garrett's stay is starting off as any normal day getting yelled at by his older sister, Lauren, which leads to him getting, literally, thrown out of the house and flung into local adventures with his best friend, Eric Espada. After blowing up the television and being handed $15 in order to pay for a fun outing, Berger and Eric head out to downtown. The art is extremely vivid, with clean lines and clean professional coloring skills. Enjoying this comic's art and dialogue is like watching a modern-day cartoon. Head into... Hypnovius's Bazaar of the Strange and read LWB Averse by LOL What Burger rated E. And that was our featured comic, uh, LWB Verse. Maybe that's a better way of saying it. The the guys the guys uh Tance and Baines ganged up on me and said I was saying it wrong. And <laughs> so now it's it's LWB Verse. <laughs> Enjoy it. So I, to be fair, I have no idea how that would be pronounced. Like, <laughs> it's cool to read. It'd be hard to figure out how to say it out loud. Libovus. Libovus. It's Russian. <laughs> well, next up we have the featured uh, music. Gamos has given us the theme to Barkham Horror. Which is a comic that's been nice. on the site for a long time. It's been featured. Uh, I can't remember who did that. Like, I think it was either Kwai or School Monkey. I don't know. It's been on, probably Kwai. It's been on the site for a long time. It's a great comic, very um, mysterious. So, Barkham Horror. Plucking and strumming guitar sounds and echoing percussion suggest a creeping, sneaking, exploring investigator in a dark, dusty old house, sidling from room to room, peering into dark, spider-webbed corners. So, take it away, Gumwells, with Barkham Horror. 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 Horror.
and that was Gun Wallace's theme for Barkham Horror, which is a comic by Scott D, and it's rated E. Scott D, rated E. Oh, I love that. It rhymes. Rhymes in time. Scott D, rated E. Well, let's get into this. Like, okay, backgrounds. Background styles. There are a lot of different ways of approaching backgrounds, aren't there? It's like as many ways as possible for approaching backgrounds. You could do like the... What uh, Tance does, of course, which is just do like photos and copy and paste everything on. <laughs> I'm lying. I am. I am. I am lying to you. Tance does not do this. This is Tance draws her backgrounds painstakingly from reference and reality, and they they are representation of Greece. If you guys don't mind, I would totally absolutely copy based on my backgrounds. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but there are a lot of different ways to approach you know copy and pasting is a legitimate method um for certain people there is there can be problems with copying and pasting in that if you're just copying and pasting a background it'll often be way too busy because reality is messy and when you're getting photos you know stock photos or you're taking them them yourself it's just there's all sorts of color levels and contrast levels and stuff like that. So when people do copy and paste backgrounds, it's usually best to apply a filter, which is what a lot of people do. So they posterize it, which simplifies the colors and the shapes, or they'll like desaturate it or they'll fade it out or something like that in order to make your foreground stand out a lot more. So if you're going to do the copy and paste thing, you still have to do extra work. It's not like, oh, it's easy. I'll just pick a photo and there's that you still have to like do color matching and all sorts of things. So there's, it's not really as much of a shortcut as you'd think it is. So yeah, mm -hmm. but it's a legitimate approach. If you want to do it, do it, but be aware that you're going to have to make your foreground stand out. But none of us work that way. We are people who chiefly draw our backgrounds, aren't we? That's what we mainly mm -hmm. do. Actually, not chiefly. That is what we do. We don't actually do any other way. We draw our backgrounds. Um, I do. I've kind of gone a little bit all over the place, actually, personally. You've copy and pasted, but when? <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. But when you copy and paste, it's stuff that you've actually drawn, though. I'm pretty well, sure. Well, stuff that I've drawn. Um, yeah, stuff that I've drawn, and uh, it'll be different angles of the, the set. You know, the main set of the series. Yeah. Um, I'll often, I have here and there used photographs. I had a mixed reaction to those. And I thought, uh, I should probably draw something. It probably makes more sense. And then put it, some kind of filter on it to make it look more you know, blurry okay. or whatever, to give it some depth. But I actually made the, um, in Google SketchUp, I did a good chunk of the video store where the comic is set um, in 3D. So it's 3D modeled. There's like a little... Uh, filter thingy over it so I have this set that I can kind of flip around and take snapshots of and use that as a background and that's, that's for certain yeah. you know that can be very effective and cut down on the workload that is an awesome awesome uh, approach because um, it means you can um, you know get a uh, spatially accurate kind of uh, uh, environment and your characters will be like real, they'll be placed like logically and realistically wherever they are because you know you've got a 3D you know, space that you, you know you've created and it works. So. Yeah, I mean obviously tons of work up front and I could do oh, a yeah. better updated version of it of course but uh, it's a, it's great. It looks good to me. And, um, you know, you can find the angles you want. It does need a redo, I think, but uh, oh, it's yeah. uh, very handy to have those backgrounds available. <laughs> yeah. The, and the other benefit of it is that, you know, you know, you're saying you can use filters, but you can make those have any, any color you want and any texture. You know, because that's how it works with the um, you know Google SketchUp kind of stuff. You can stuff isn't set to be 
a particular way you can change that yourself can't you so yeah there's different i don't even it's so long ago now that i did this set i don't remember what the filter is that i used but i looked but i found something like some kind of rendering uh, filter i don't know the terminology even but some kind of uh, process to make it look somewhat cartoony but somewhat still like realistic and textured and it was the perfect balance to me um not yeah. quite the manga thing you know where, where it's like realistic backgrounds with cartoony characters but kind of along those lines <laughs> to me anyway like it sort of approaches that like it gives a realistic flavor but it also matches the more cartoony style of the characters yeah because typical strange is a comic with um yeah cartoony style characters simple shading for the characters as well which so in backgrounds it wouldn't really work if you had complicated shading and stuff so right it that's an important thing to remember with backgrounds don't make them too different from your characters oh well okay yeah. now as i say that it depends yeah there's no right I, I, or wrongs to this exactly i think it it falls upon the style that you want to publish and also how the background how much the background meshes well with, uh, with the plot and the story itself. Because whether we like it or not, at least to a big extent, the backgrounds are part of the story and they have to be relevant for that whole in style and in, and in rendering for lack of a better word. Because for example, um, if you are creating a world where you want people not to trust that what they see, like the setting where the characters are interacting is real, maybe you don't want everything to be very accurate. Maybe you want the buildings to look a little wonky or Maybe you want uh, the angels to be a bit of, or things like that. Or if you want to go for realism, maybe you want to be very careful of um, the perspective, for example, mm -hmm. more than the detail, the, the minute details uh, that the human eye wouldn't perceive mm -hmm. because you're going for a more realistic but more perhaps alive. I mean, what I'm trying to say is that depending on the impression that you want to make and this, the tone that you want for your story, the background should more or less match. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they should not be... De well, it depends, but yeah, they should sort of stick with the style. You know, you're not going to do super colorful kind of stuff if it's a if it's a dark war story. That's going to be a um probably a fail, but it depends because you mm -hmm. might be going for a certain kind of weird effect. I don't know. Well, look at uh, what's that hit? Um, Hans Reichardt's comic. He's this awesome artist. Back on the duck, I believe, with um, mm -hmm. Eustachia and. Koshlia. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Koshlia and Eustachia, how would you pronounce them? And he's got these super detailed and crazy environments. There's no dialogue. So it's all about sort of immersing visually in what the characters are doing, but also the, the crazy stuff that's happening in the environment as they go through passageway after passageway to these crazy, strange yeah areas. the super details usually just all line work isn't it mainly like there's not yeah colored or anything <clears throat> yeah it's very very detailed line work and just beautiful and surreal like just amazingly yeah. surreal so much work in them yeah just bizarre stuff i love his work He's a genius. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, it's awesome. It's really fun to, to look at. I was going to say fun to read, but there's no, there's nothing to read. 
Well, oh, actually, that's, that's there... awesome too. There's a story, or is there? <laughs> there is in in some. Really? Yeah, there, there is text, but not always. It does make an right. appearance. You know, Cochlear and Eustacia actually talk occasionally, and you know, sometimes some of the weird characters or beings actually say some things. So yeah, there is a an element to it, but mostly it's all taught, told through uh, visual elements. And so the background elements right. are not just for background they're not just there to give like the characters some landscape in order to to play against they're often the backgrounds are very um they're part of the story right what's going on there yeah is actually comes to the foreground like like there might be giants in the background or something and suddenly these giants are actually you know interacting with the characters yeah, that kind of thing or this huge machine kind of thing in the background and suddenly the characters are falling into it you know yeah <laughs> and navigating their way into it yeah so or it could just uh, simply be an um, an indirect effect uh, like for example the the background is too desolate and it starts getting to the characters for example or or uh, they are lost and it being alien is in itself uh, some kind of emotional impact um, that the characters suffer and so on and so forth. Yeah. Or it could be for the benefit of the audience. Like for example, I have had in Without Moonlight a lot of people tell me like how beautiful you know the the town looks or the city looks or whatever, and and uh, all the while this beauty exists there are these terrible things taking place within this beautiful setting and that makes an impact and so on and so forth one of the greatest things about without moonlight and its backgrounds is that they give you the impression like if you go to greece you go to athens you recognize those landscapes very easily in the artwork so it really gives you a feel for the actual a place that the story takes place in so it's very um you know historically and historically accurate but it actually fits with reality as well it gives you a good impression of what greece is like so that is yeah a fantastic aspect of without Thank moonlight you. um uh, for my approach in bottomless waitress is um approach that i i picked because i do way too much work in pinky ta i like you know render every single leaf on a tree every link on a track you know like madness <laughs> and it's just i can't help myself from doing that for some reason but so i decided like i wanted to do bottomless waitress a lot quicker and you know without putting in that much level of, of detail so i forced myself to do like no backgrounds for a lot of the pages uh, well no not drawn backgrounds what i would do is do like hints of what's in the story sometimes i would do a whole a filler panel with like you know the diner itself an establishing shot maybe the in, inside of the diner something like that and then for the rest of the panels it'll just be textured paint brush work so i'll pick like a bunch of texture brushes these are digital brushes i'm talking about but they have like random textures like maybe dots or something like this or like i'll, I'll do a gradient first off and then i'll do a bunch of colored like sprays of brushwork and that will add texture and some kind of like a character to the panel which will make it it's not boring like like visually you'll see like there's interesting like colors and, and shapes but i've ha haven't had to draw you know render anything in detail so it performs its function without being overwhelming and often the panel background art in um in bottomless waitress will be um like i'll try to to capture an emotional feel of what's happening in the panels so i'll use like uh like pinks and reds and this kind of thing to show characters are angry or happy and blues and you know, greens and things like this to show that they're sad or, or you know thing it's a darkness to what's happening so oh, cool. I'll go for an emotional kind of feel in in my color choices. So yeah, that's that's 
how I approach that. That would be something to try, man. Ooh. I'd have tried that. Well, um... Yeah, like, one of the other things I do is also darkness and shade, so... Some of Pinky T, oh not Pinky T, uh, Bottomless Waitress was in recent panels happening at night, so I would ch I chose you know the bluey greens d in darker shades to show that it was you know night time, but also the choice of color would be you know the the emotional choices as well. So yeah, right. a, a bluey kind of stuff because it was sad. Whereas, you know, maybe if it was like a happy nighttime scene, I might have chose like darker browns or something like this, you know, to right. to be more ready tones. Or yet, you can't do dark yellow. <laughs> yellow is a is a it's a tricky thing. You can't do dark yellow because it turns green or grey. So that's weird. Have you guys ever tried to do dark yellow? Yeah, um, I actually. For me, it turns a little bit uh, more towards uh, ochre. I don't. Mm. I'm not sure about the name in English. Um, yeah, ochre. That's an English name for. A... Okay. Uh, or more mustard in a sense. Mustard, yeah. So you, so, it, and that yeah. tips it towards brown. Yeah. So the uh, the more you do it that way, that's the ready yellow tones. Yeah. Uh, Yellow though is that it, it, it's a, it can uh, stand in for two different emotions, joy and happiness and yeah, uh, you know, we are all feeling very nice. It's a small world after all. Or <laughs> it could uh, stand in for depression. Oh really? But it, yeah, uh, and actually that is a that's a bit of a code uh, in uh, color theory. For uh, in psychology, that uh, often, of course, you have to get for every person the associations that they make to the colors, the emotional associations. They are not universal, but often uh, joy can go either uh, not joy, yellow can go either way, either towards joy as an association or towards um, depression or negative emotions that are, however not um, they are intense in a sense for, so for example a depressed person could have yellow now i don't really want to say that because i don't want people to take this as oh my god i i like yellow or i feel attracted to yellow so now that means i'm depressed or something please don't take it like this <laughs> and it's a it just there is a tendency for yellow to be also associated with negative emotions in certain contexts so that can be used in backgrounds a lot so for example it can also be associated with illness uh, yellow so, uh, yeah exactly so um it's not just the color itself it's it's how you use it because blue for example can also be used for joyous occasions with the right shade and in the right context again. Yeah, so, certain shades of blue. Mm -hmm. It's like you, you wouldn't go for greeny blues, you'd go for, I don't know, more mm -hmm. um, saturated for, for example, blue. Some of my characters were of yellow or yellowish clothes at times, and that's uh, usually when I have them be borderline depressed or harboring such uh, such emotions without actually expressing it. Uh, Alex wears a lot of mustard be yellowy and stuff for that purpose. It's my little code, if you like. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Color codes. That's, a, that's an interesting thing, uh, color coding characters. That's what I do with actually um, in uh, Pinky TA. Um, of course, Pinky's main color is pink for her hair, but she always wears a burgundy reds, you know, deep reds. That's her um, mm -hmm. color. Whereas uh, CC, her nemesis, wears um, purple. That's her, you know, that's her theme color. So mm -hmm. the characters have these, and they don't have any particular meaning. I've just given them those colors originally, and they so they always have them. <laughs> no, um, 
yeah, I have seen that and they, it really fits them. For some reason, I cannot explain it and I will not attempt. Um, but my characters, I don't actually have a code, a, col a coloring code for them. It's uh, just that at times, because they change clothes, not very frequently, they <laughs> for obvious reasons, but uh, when they do, usually what they go for in terms of wearing, and unless you know, they don't really have a, a choice if they're wearing uniforms and stuff, but um, if they have a choice, the color that they go for is always significant in my pages. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, because they're choosing what they're wearing. It's not just mm -hmm. their uniform or their everyday wear, yeah, which makes a lot of sense. Well, so back to backgrounds, um, we've approached like, okay, okay, we didn't approach the white background, so you can have plain white. Um, this is usually like um, when you're having a high contrast scene, you know, silhouettes, or, you know, like veins and stuff at the moment where you're highlighting the characters as the main part of the story because, you know, they're talking about a world where, you know, nothing exists or whatever. So that's a good kind of stylistic use of, like, eliminating backgrounds because that is your comic world and your characters are escaping from it. They're, like, almost between the panels where, you know, the guttering exists. So yeah. that's that's another clever use. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, like I wrote that whole story so the world could cease to exist, and therefore I wouldn't have to draw backgrounds. <laughs> <laughs> Never backgrounds hey. anymore, ever again. Never again. Yes. If only I could make the characters now invisible, then, then I'd really be <laughs> Just dialogue. Well, <laughs> in, in the latest issue of Pinky TA, which had been going on for ages and ages and ages, the thing there was that the um, it's in the snow, and I thought, well, if I'm doing snow, then I don't have to really do backgrounds because it's just snow. But snow is bloody hard to draw. It's not easy. Because it's like, you know, how do you draw hills and things in snow? It has to be, like, different shades of, like, grey and, and greyish blue and bluey purple and stuff like that in order to differentiate the things. And you know, how do you show distance in snow? You have to draw footprints and do mm -hmm. atmosphere. Varic, uh perspective, so it's darker to light, uh, and it's just there's no easy shortcuts. <laughs> um, not really, but you do have. There is a, a beautiful natural effect uh, when, uh, you know, when you're drawing towards the horizon that you can use. It's that. The detail gets less and less. Mm. The colors have to be fainter and fainter in a sense. And uh, you can get away with just the, the impression of something. And it will still look detailed. Yeah. Um, something I often do. Please don't go back to look at my backgrounds. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'll examine them very closely. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can totally exploit that. And uh, when it comes to scenes where you have open vistas that actually do go all the way to the horizon or like uh, mountains especially, uh, those you can just uh, free paint, at least I do, um, with uh, different shades of, uh, of blue. Yeah. So that they so that they blend in with the with the sky, let's say. So that's a good approach. Um yeah, it saves you a bit of time and a bit of effort and you can say, yeah, this is the impression of a of a like a horizon and a, the sky and you, you know, you don't have to draw it exactly. You can do something that has the effect. Um I suppose I should also cover if you want to do something like realistically and you know if, if you are like silly like me and want to put in all the bits and pieces the way I approached that was um, 
first working out the background that's going to be realistic for the situation as we've talked about you know whether it's inside a building or you know in a snowy field or whatever then what I'd like to do is well first like like if I'm drawing this particular background instead of just painting it which is what I do often now like I'll draw the inside of a building that so I do like perspective which you know you work out where your horizon line is going to be like if it's uh, if your character is standing on the level then the horizon line is at the eye level where your character is that's where the the horizon line should be at their eye level if the character is higher than you then the horizon should be lower than their eye level if the character is mm-hmm. below you then the horizon line should be above the character's eye level so that's an important thing to remember you know so mm-hmm. everything recedes up to that point or down to that point or whatever or you know you can have like multiple perspectives but you know then you're making things a bit hard for yourself but that's fine if you've got multiple perspectives always the horizon line should be you know where you want it so it doesn't matter how many perspectives you've got horizon line should be like above the character below the character right their eye line depending on how high they're going to be so that's important um unless you're talking about aerial perspective where things you know um recede into the sky or down below but these that's going at super advanced level you probably won't need to remember that <laughs> um yeah so there's that so if you're going to paint we should do an episode on that perspective actually <laughs> I, I should yeah i'll do a detailed one at some stage that's uh that is a huge topic gigantic um so then if you're going to paint in the background then you've got to sort of think okay what are some of the simple general things this background's going to have so if it's like uh the floor of a warehouse or something it's going to like be textured and gritty so you're going to like choose a textured brush and just do a bunch of like textury kind of things um but okay i skipped a step so you want to start out with a gradient as your ultimate background so you know dark to light like um you know you're going to have this in whatever angle you want so you don't have your you have to have your gradient like being dark straight on the top and then light down the bottom you could like have it dark in one corner and then lightening down or maybe you've got like three or four different colors in your gradient this is also a good way to do it so think about what colors are going to be in your background and just pick your general ones and fill the whole the whole panel with that then you paint on on your texture effects and a good way to do it is choose like do an use an eyedropper and pick out colors from your gradient and then paint them over the top that way they don't stand out massively they just sort of add texture to it so that's another good thing to do like it, say if you're outdoors or something then you want like like grass or dirt or, or whatever and you pick the texture for for dirt you know so you have like little rough kind of textury kind of uh bristly effects if you're doing grass then you'll like want little kind of little ticks to do your grass don't do it all in one color you know you'll do like a whole bunch of different greens for your grass that kind of stuff a sky like Towns was saying sky is a simple gradient so dark blue at the top almost white at the horizon it depends like you wouldn't want to do white but you know like a really light blue and that's a pretty easy thing to do so like i could i could do a whole crack cast on this kind of stuff but you know this is good general advice if you want to do like more realistic stuff oh goodness me (laughs) that is good and you are only you're going to be the only person talking about perspective at least uh, as far as i'm concerned well you have (laughs) <laughs> you, you guys definitely have perspective in your backgrounds, but maybe you don't think about it as much. But it's definitely I there. I think about depth. Like the first time I used a blurred background, I fell in love with it, and now I, you know, I use it very often as the, the filmic kind of technique. It's an easy way to make things look better. <clears throat> give that kind of depth. Oh yeah, blurring is good, and it's not easy. You. Th- think it's easy but it takes a while to master so if, you know if, yeah. 
you've I've seen your your guys' background, especially you Baines, and you master it really well. And that is not simple. You can't just automatically be good at doing blurred backgrounds because you can do realistic backgrounds. You can't. You have to understand how filmmakers use it and then try and implement it. So Yeah, I, I actually shy away from blurring the backgrounds because I I don't feel very confident blurring the background really. Um, because I haven't really to be honest, by the time I I have finished inking that monster that usually I <laughs> I don't want to do it either. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But uh, there's also that. But uh, on the other hand, it, I really uh, feel that I have to know why this part is blurred and that part isn't. And when I don't try, I, I opt just to not try it. So what? this is, was a long-winded uh, support to what I uh, was just said. I oh, know that's I I have the same feeling you know I go I have a plan in my head thinking I'm gonna blur this background and that will be my thing and then I realize that when I try it I just keep messing up because I'm thinking like okay I, I just can't paint a blurry thing it doesn't work that way like I well I mean it could if I knew how to do it but I'm not very good at that so what I tend to do is you know then I think oh I'll have to draw the whole thing and then blur it and <laughs> right there yeah and that doesn't work either because then you've just drawn the whole damn thing anyway so you may as well just use it <laughs> and then I mean, you defeat the purpose that definitely like a detailed background then blurred looks a lot better though I've yeah. tried doing crowd scenes or just like, oh, I'll just smear, I'll just do a bunch of colors and basics and then blur it. It's like, ah, doesn't look as good. You have to draw the whole thing in detail. <laughs> yeah. And then oh, blur it and like, then it looks good. So it kind of sucks. But... <laughs> you have to blur it and stuff. Um, uh, you can't get away with um, simplified sketching, but you still need to sketch every single little human. Yeah, uh, right. Which, you need which to. Which is I've started to regret a lot, especially lately, that I have the crowd scene after crowd scene after crowd scene. <sighs> right. And, um, yeah. I hate crowd scenes. <laughs> you really need to understand what you're doing for that stuff. I mean, you look at if you look at some in the paintings of the impressionists, you know, the French impressionists from the late 1800s. They used mm -hmm. to they like pioneered this stuff this these techniques and they do that all the time and they just just use a, a simple couple of brush strokes and they create a whole human form and it's recognizable as a human form but there's no detail there if you focus in on it there's nothing it's just a blob yeah so it is possible mm -hmm. to do but you just have to know what you're doing exactly and practice so yeah I've seen like manga and especially anime sometimes use featureless background characters. And it kind of, I mean, it's, I'm not used to seeing that so much. So it, it looks weird to me, hmm. but I mean, I, it's, it's, I'm okay with it, but I, whenever I've tried to do that hmm. without a blur in particular, it doesn't work for me. <laughs> like it's like, ah, that doesn't work. Oh, well, a, a blank white panel works okay yeah even if there, there's supposed to be an environment there like come on maybe that's more of a western thing versus an eastern convention or something um, another be. thing that i have seen works at least it looks like to me like it works don't uh, tell me it doesn't <laughs> yeah. uh, is that um uh, once you have uh, drawn the background and the establishing shot and a couple of uh side shots maybe um, you can get away with drawing only shades from the palette of that particular background if if they are shades from where from what would logically be behind that person like a, if for example they are standing against the, the schoolhouse 
then the callers from the schoolhouse would have been behind that person and mm. not the caller forest, for example. And oh, yeah. then mm. you have left this in a way that shows their emotional state. Like, for example, I often uh, make a shaded uh, surface, semi surface, when someone is uh, having tunnel vision or is very focused on something, or uh, straight lines that are jagged for someone that is very startled or, or, or um, are experiencing a, a curt, very strong emotion that is uh, very sudden and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that it does work to, to give the impression that there is still a background behind them, but also underline the headspace in which they are in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, we were talking about anime um, or manga, some of the other tools they use, and some Western comics is um, half tones. So these are a bunch of stylized dots. Uh, used to be like applied by cutting these damn things out and pasting them on the page, but also, you know, digitally now. Um, yeah, so half tones, it's a bunch of dots that create a kind of textured shading. Um, line work, you know, a cross hatching and stuff like that, the stippling, mm -hmm. just to fill up the background with different kinds of textured shading. And that, you know, has that effect that Tans is talking about, like, you know, lines to show um, what a character's thinking like in and their state of mind like in anime or sorry manga another very classic thing is to show lines radiating out from a character and sometimes yeah. that can indicate speed or surprise or shock so that is incredibly effective so it, the in those kind of situations your background actually communicates as much as text does or expression or body language so yeah you can use them yeah. in all different ways. Uh, that's the more, and and those are stylized and they're a lot easier and quicker to draw because, you know, you're just doing it in a particular way and it's, um, you can almost copy and paste this stuff. And I think, yeah, a lot of the time you can actually find brushes that do these effects anyway. And uh, right. I don't know, like uh, as we're talking about different kinds of backgrounds, so, would be remiss if we weren't to uh, talk about sprite comics which were a thing back in the early 2000s i don't know if people still do them now but in sprite comics they do they draw a bunch of predefined backgrounds or construct a bunch of these and maybe from like uh elements from a game or they're making their own like tiles based on you know what would be in a game so like a, a square tile or whatever and they they build the background like lego and then they can place that behind a character or in a particular scene wherever they need it. And it's incredible, this kind of stuff. Huh. It's it's admirable in the, the way they, they build it. So, yeah, that's, that is another legitimate way of using backgrounds because it shows, sure. like, the location as it would in a game, uh, like a, a sprite game or a, a, a JRPG or something. So, yeah, that's another another way of doing it. Right. All approaches are valid and they have a place. So I think the point of this Quackcast is just to say there's many ways of pro approaching backgrounds and don't think that any particular way is wrong. Just think about what applies to your own work the best and what you have time enough to do and skill enough to do and what you like doing too don't think you have to do something in a particular way don't think you have to approach it realistically or whatever negative space yes now that is another thing now that is um like when we're talking about say a white background and black characters you're having n like positive negative space there mm -hmm. and you could also do the reverse so you could have a black space with white characters so yeah um, white. yeah but negative space mm -hmm. is is way more than just that. I mean, that's looking at, say, having a strong foreground figure, perhaps, and the background is, like, fitting in around them in a certain way, which is your negative space. Maybe you've got a sky in a panel, 
and what kind of shape is your sky versus your character or your foreground things like machines or whatever that you have in the foreground so yeah a lot of uh, use of negative space as background has um, can be found in uh, uh, noir graph novels and uh, noir films yeah like uh, the, the very standard um, the figure that walks into a dark room and uh, the dark room is all black mm. in in completely black and it's the figure of the person that and 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 the light from the corridor for example that streams in yeah. and and that is the shot it's black and white basically but you still see 3d objects although you have basically a big black blob which is something i admire um haven't practiced though so frank miller's sin city i think did they mm -hmm. use that approach yeah. it's classic for yeah noir style heavy dark blacks and yeah highlighted silhouettes and things like this is very effective at building mood it's beautiful okay. gives a very when we say noir that gives a particular like there's an era that's evoked in that so you're looking at like you know 1940s 1930s kind of uh, classic look to things as well because it comes from that era of films when that style was invented um or popularized for you know the whole noir detective fiction so yeah that's a that lends you a certain cachet of uh you know, it evokes a stylistic period, and and that's taken on by things like Batman and stuff like that. There is a there's a definite theme in in Batman that follows that, isn't it? And I think that's where Frank Miller picked up that you know was influenced to do that style because he did uh, Batman comics, didn't he? Yeah. And that style had existed, you know, prior to Frank Miller, so that was had always you know had its uh, appearances in in that particular comic well we've covered a lot of interesting aspects of backgrounds i'm pleased to have uh, done an, an art focused quack cast guys yeah yeah thank you great. for that yeah yeah we can do it tomorrow why not yeah maybe we will tackle the idea of perspective although that is a, a technical subject so <laughs> and it's hard to talk about perspective without showing it yeah I very <laughs> talk about perspective just um, just let me know <laughs> well it's something that everyone sort of instinctively knows how to do but they don't know they know it. so it's it's hard because it's it's like mathematics you instinctively know a bit about mathematics but as soon as you try and think about it then you start to mess up at this i do anyway that's so <laughs> a that's a dodgy thing all right well next week guys thank you very much for listening to the quack cast and if you want, yeah, if you want extra stuff, then um, uh, you can join our Patreon and look at the videos. So that's the, the extra element that a lot of you are missing out on. Okay. Yes. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.